The following program is brought to you by Bruce Telecom and Whiteman TV. Adventure Talk of 2018. We do have one more lecture that's happening on May the 7th, which is a Monday morning with Dr. Towler returning to us on his talk about train trip, uh, his train trip through Spain. So please join us for that lecture coming up on a Monday morning. Uh, we also have three exits to the theatre that I'd just like to point your attention to in case of any emergency this morning. So there is an exit located behind the stage, and there are two exits to my right. So if, if we have any uh, need to evacuate, please do so calmly and uh, we'll get you out safely. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Justin Peter, who's come today to talk to us about his trip to Antarctica. So Justin is Quest Nature's Tour Director of Programs and senior naturalist. He was born and raised in Canada to parents who immigrated from different countries and schooled in French immersion. Justin became a student of languages and cultures from an early age. A keen interest in nature also came to him early. And so one might say that travel came naturally to him as well, when he was whisked off to visit relatives in faraway places. Driven by a desire to share his observations with others and an aptitude, so he was led to believe, to help others develop their own interests, he began leading nature walks in his early teen years and was ultimately able to make a career that married his multiple passions. He worked for several years as a senior naturalist in Ontario's world-renowned Algonquin Park, where he coordinated the park's interpretive program and recruited, mentored, uh, and encouraged promising young naturalists. In addition to, ser to serving as the lead howler for Algonquin's celebrated public wolf howlers. Sorry, howls. <laughs> <laughs> Justin moved to Quest Nature Tours in early 2013. In addition to overseeing the tour roster, Justin has personally led tours to such places as India, Peru, Namibia, the Galapagos Islands, Canada's Arctic, Hudson Bay, and Antarctica. Justin fills the balance of his time with various other activities. He just completed revisions to a popular book, Trees of Algonquin Park, and he is the moderator for the public or the Facebook group Ontario Birds. He's vice president of the Toronto Ornitho ornithological club and a member of Ontario Field Naturalists, uh, sorry, ornithologists. He's a member of the Brody Club, one of Canada's oldest and most prestigious natural history clubs, and a popular guest speaker and trip leader at na uh, nature festivals and naturalist clubs, and admits a particular fondness to the Huron Fringe Birding Festival. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much, Justin, for taking the time to come and present to us today. And uh, I'll invite you up to the front. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. And it is my, uh, my pleasure, my honor to be here. And it's also, uh, I am very fortunate that my line of work takes me to far away places, as, uh, as is obvious. That is me in the photo. And uh, I did have a chance to travel with work to Antarctica this past, uh, I won't say exactly when, I'll hold off for a little while. I'll just say in the last year, <laughs> there's a reason for this, I, I had a chance to go to Antarctica for work as a, as a, a trip for the Canadian University Alumni Association um, travel program where multiple where travelers who are graduates of multiple various universities have a chance to go down um, go to different places with experts can you hear me properly there does that sound okay okay great 
Is that okay now? Yeah. Great. So, question. What do you think of when we talk about Antarctica, when we, when we say Antarctica? Penguins. Penguins? Ice. Ice? Cold. Cold? Like Bruce County cold? Yeah? Dry? Okay, so we have anything else? Rough seas. Rough seas, okay. Beautiful. Beautiful, okay. Well, I guess you're seeing uh, the image. Not me, but uh, the image here. So, Antarctica, you, you seem to have certain uh, clear ideas about what it is, and it is sort of surprising that we think of it at all because it is really so far away down here that, that what appears to be a huge, often white mass. <laughs> And uh, it might be surprising to you, but really Antarctica is a recent, uh, only a, r a relatively recent discovery, but it was often thought about, it's been thought about for hundreds of years, and it's even the ancients thought about Antarctica. They didn't know it existed, but they thought if there's so much land mass in the north part of the world, there has to be something balancing it out, balancing the weight of the, the north on the south. And they called it the unknown southern continent. And this map here from the 16th century shows you the known world along with this huge massive land at the bottom. No one had actually been there, no one knew anything about it, no one knew its shape, but it had to be there. And uh, it was only really in the 18th century when someone actually um, came very close or whose, whose voyages inspired someone to look seriously for this unknown southern land. Anyone recognize this guy? Cook. Cook. This is Captain Cook who made various voyages uh, around the world exploring the Pacific and one of his missions was to find this southern unknown continent. Now he never did quite see it. He had three voyages, the, the three colored lines we see here are his voyages. On one of his voyages he came close and he was stopped by ice. And he kept going and it, you know what, it would have been almost forgotten. However, on his way home, just about here, he, he landed on an island called, or a group of islands, the South Georgia Island which I'm not gonna talk about today, but he landed there and he gave accounts for what he had seen here. Based on that, he claimed it for the United Kingdom and he sailed off home. And within a very short time, interest was fairly significant. But I'll read a passage from, from, the, uh, from Captain Cook's um, notes here. These southern lands, these are lands doomed by nature to perpetual frigidness, never to feel the warmth of the sun's rays, whose horrible and savage aspect I have not words to describe. Such are the lands we have discovered. What then may we expect those to be which lie still further south? So he was here, he's talking about there. For we may reasonably suppose that we have seen the best as lying most to the north. If anyone should have a resolution and perseverance to clear up this point by proceeding farther than I have done, I shall not envy him the honor of the discovery, but I will be bold to say that the world will not be benefited by it. <laughs> so why am I here today? <laughs> but. Captain Cook describes something very important on those islands, South Georgia Islands, which are right over here. So he got to about here. He discovered wildlife, wildlife that had fur on it, seals, and once word got out in the north, experienced sealers in the northern hemisphere heard of the wondrous numbers of seals to be had, and they came, and within 20 years, Tens of thousands of seal pelts were being exported to China. Five dollars US a piece, 1800. Five dollars US, 1800. One guy had 80,000 pelts in one shipment. Think about that. So there was known to be abundant wildlife here. So that was a reason to go there, wildlife to be exploited. But that wasn't enough because no one had yet seen the continent. However, in 1820, these three 
men from different countries, an American, this is not the man, but this is a, a commemoration of Bransfield, and Bellinghausen for, for Russia, within one year, all sighted, finally, Antarctica, the continent. And of course, once that was sighted, if you're coming from a big colonizing country, you want your country to claim it or to be the first one to find what? The South Pole. Why? I don't know why. But it took nearly <laughs> a century yet in the first part of the 20th century for anyone to attempt to cross the continent and eventually one Nor uh, Norwegian did get to the South Pole. So the race was on to go down to Antarctica. So of course this is what we're, this is the South Pole here, this is the continent looking down. And um, you know, it's a fairly substantial piece of land, it's the fifth largest continent. And um, how would you go about visiting this continent? Of course, we in our group were going to look for all these things you described, penguins and ice um, and uh, beauty. And to also get an appreciation of the hardship of this environment, the fragility of, the, of this environment, and get a context for the natural history and the significance of exploration. Now, when you're going to Antarctica, I'll just show you what is the piece of land we visited. So we actually went down to the tip of South America, to Punta Arenas, which is in Chile. We flew over to the Falkland Islands, which are UK. Is that mouse moving with my... Yeah. Isn't that strange? How is that? <laughs> He's following along. <laughs> the mouse that wants to go to Antarctica, uh, <laughs> apparently. And uh, we actually fly to the Falkland Islands, which are famous for the Falkland Islands War, which are a British possession. We would cross down to Antarctica, sail down what is called the Antarctic Peninsula, sail back to this island here, King George Island. That's Mad King George. And fly back to Punta Arenas. Now, I'm showing you a little piece of wh where we're going. I'm calling it the Antarctic Peninsula, but to go back to Antarctica to show you how big Antarctica is, this is North America, this is Antarctica. I'm showing you this. So think about that. That's a very, very small part, in fact, of the continent, which is, you know, less than going up in it's half of Florida basically. So very, very thin part. Why can we only visit a very small part? Well, obviously the continent's huge. There are other challenges too. That white stuff on the continent isn't an accident. Almost all of the continent is covered with ice. We're talking a few hundred meters to up to over a kilometer or two of ice, basically. And, and, and some of this is in fact below sea level. There's so much ice on it that the ice has pushed it down. And if you remove the ice without raising the sea levels, a good part of it would be underwater, believe it or not, just from the weight. But 95% of the coastline is also basically ice. You can't <coughs> land on it because there's this huge sheet of ice all around it. So this part here, the Antarctic Peninsula, especially at this northern ex extremity, is the warmest, it is the mildest, it has the most exposed coastline and, and possibly the densest uh, assortment of interesting items to see just because you can actually get there. So we're talking a very small, very, very small part of that. Now, when do you go to Antarctica? I didn't disclose exactly when I went. There's a little issue as well because this is not static, that white blob. <laughs> this is Antarctica. Also, do you see it? No, this is Antarctica at the height of the austral winter. So during our summer, when they have winter, the ice area doubles in size. So huge amount of sea ice forms around it and that's what it looks like. Now, there's the Antarctic Peninsula here. We can't quite <laughs> visit it unless we want to fly and land on it pretty much. That's not going to work. So you do have to go in the summer. This is a contrast of ice cover. So the ice is covering the land. There are some permanent ice sheets on it here, ice shelves, and then the ice expands. And in their winter, in their autumn, the ice expands five kilometers per day. Can you imagine that? So think about how 
cold that must be. <laughs> it's like, that's not happening. What we see outside here, don't have no fear. <laughs> this will go away. <laughs> So yes, we go at a time when we can't actually get there when the, the sea is open and we're going there because we're going by expedition vessel. Now this is the vessel we use, which is called the Academic Sergei Vavilov, which is owned by the Russian Academy of Sciences. And it, it is a, a leased vessel that we use. And it takes about 120 passengers potentially, but we had 80 passengers upon this. So it's actually, 80 might sound like a lot, but when you think that some of these cruise ships are like 5,000 people, this is small. This is as small as you can go to visit a place like this with, with, with little impact, or as little impact as possible. And uh, this is not a luxury cruise, and I'm not trying to sell you a, a cabin, although, let me tell you, let me tell you about this one. <laughs> but they're, they're simple, but they're nice, clean and comfortable, it's not luxury, we have, we have good food, very friendly Russian staff aboard, um, as in the, the, the people who look after the vessel itself. And uh, you know, it's a nice place, it's a nice place for socializing, but really it's made to enjoy the outside. It's not made to keep you inside nice and comfy. It's made to allow you to be comfortable enough to enjoy the outdoors. So what do we have to do? As I said, we fly, we, we had to go to South America, that mouse isn't going away, fly to Port Stanley here and embark upon this voyage. Now this is a fairly significant, it looks fairly significant. That is 800 kilometers in distance that we have to traverse to go from here by here by ship. Now how long would it take, that take you by car? a day, basically eight hours driving, if you're on the 401 from, let's say, Windsor to Montreal, that will take about two to two and a half days by vessel. And that's going relatively quickly. You have some things <laughs> in the way. You have the ocean <laughs> and if this works, and you may have heard someone here said, Does that make you feel good? <laughs> so it is known, um, this is, in fact, we were slightly east of the place that's called the Drake Passage, but we're well within its reach. You have, may have heard that there can be rough sailing in this stretch, and that is true. Oop, I'm not gonna replay that for you. Because there is a huge current that's going through this area, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current here which effectively is isolating the northern world from the southern ocean, which is below this current. So you're going through here. This current goes around all of Antarctica, or here, this area in red, variously broad. And so this is the southern ocean. And however, this passage is the narrowest. So the largest volume of water is being compressed through this passage from South America and the Falklands here, down to the Antarctic Peninsula, the equivalent of 60,000 Niagara Falls is going through at any, across this section here. Think about that, 60,000 Niagara Falls. So um, you don't imagine yourself cruising down Niagara Falls 60,000 times. That's not what I meant, but that, I'm just talking about the volume. And cool water here is less salty than warmer water here. What happens with warm things? warm things rise, but if they're saltier, they sink and they're warm. So warm, salty water is sinking under cooler water here. So you just imagine what that will do. And that's basically what you can be going through combined with the winds. Now, if there are no winds, which can be the case, it is simply called the Drake Lake, and it could be easy cruising. We didn't, have, didn't quite have that this time. However, I have to say, I did appreciate the chance to practice some moves. 
because everyone else was getting, not everyone, but a lot of people were, eh, you know, I'm not doing so well. You can use the patch, you can use gravel to settle your stomach and you'll feel fine. I didn't do that, I just liked the balancing act and after a while, it's good for all of your, the muscles you didn't know you had. <laughs> so, so that's really what we're going through through to get to here. Now the other thing is that there is a big temp temperature difference. When you're north of this convergence zone, it could be 10, it could be 15 degrees Celsius, and at certain points suddenly you will cross and it will be five to 10 degrees cooler. So that's part of the experience of getting to Antarctica. Antarctica isn't just the land, it's also that southern ocean. And I won't make you relive that again, if you weren't feeling so well. Oh wait, it wants to play. Oh, what's that? Albatross. One good thing about wind is it's good for birds that need wind to fly. And this is a great, probably the greatest place in the world to see a good number of albatross of various species. Now, I don't know if I'll, I'll replay this. I'll just tell you a little anecdote. In the dining room one night, one, one afternoon for lunch, we were having lunch. So two days of crossing, we're not going onto land, obviously we're having lectures, presentations. And uh, I just remember being in the dining room and they have portholes there. And I saw this big wave go. It went quite high over the height of the window. And then I didn't see anything else happen. And then five seconds later, all these wine glasses in the kitchen <laughs> fell over and broke. <laughs> I could have seen that coming. If I'd known that was gonna cause that, I would have, hold the wine glasses. But anyways, so it was fun. Honestly, it's a great experience. And uh, I would say you, you're lucky to experience the, the waves. I think that's really, just imagine you're a sailor in the early 18th century. I'll show you a bit of the rise here from the vessel. Boom. You can feel that now, right? There you go. Enough. Okay. <laughs> so, as I said, a great place for birds both that have narrow, long, skinny wings for whom flapping a lot really would take up a lot of energy. Fantastic place for seabirds such as this pintado or, or cape petrel, beautiful bird. Birds that just, they happen to follow the ship because the ship is there and sometimes they can use the wake of the ship or like drag. To, to get a little bit more uplift. Birds like this, I'm not sure if it's beautiful or not. Tell me if, what you think. The southern giant petrel, wingspan easily seven feet, big bird. And various albatrosses, maybe the most endearing is the black-browed albatross that breeds in the, the circum Antarctic, the subantarctic islands. It doesn't breed in Antarctica, but it comes down here because all that churning is good for food and it's following us, and of course the, the most famous, the wandering albatross with a wingspan of almost 12 feet. Huge bird, I mean, I, I think you can't, I can't describe how big that is, it's just gigantic and wonderful to see them passing along. And also behind the ship. You can see one going up. That's a black-browed albatross down and up. This is the back of the ship. Okay, I won't, I won't make you any more sick with that. So eventually you go through that change in temperature as you go over that current and we go for a while and a while and um, we're expecting to see something and not necessarily right away, but we start to see an increase in the number of icebergs suddenly. When an icebergs are pieces of ice, this is not sea ice, this is not ice that formed from seawater that froze. This is ice that's coming off of land and breaking off a glacier. And when you have a lot of sea ice, you know that you're probably close to land. And you also know that if this works, it might take a second here. When you start to see penguins, never too far to land from land, at this time of year, February, because February is the breeding season and they are raising young. These are chinstrap penguins returning to their colony. There you have a nice look.
at them. And I'm just going to go back here. And eventually, you sight land. Now, this, this was our first land. This is in the sub-Antarctic islands, the South Shetland Islands. This is called Elephant Island. Why is it called Elephant Island? I thought it might be shaped like an elephant. I looked for it. It's in fact named after elephant seals, which I'll show you later. But um, you'll know you're near a place where there's life in Antarctica because we, we didn't quite get on to the land here, and I'll show you why. Because look at the water. If you zoom in, this is what the water looked like. In fact, we weren't planning to land here, but we were going to do a zodiac ride, which I'll show you later. Um, at another place, but the water can be rough. But you know you're near a place where there's life. Note the giant glacier here, huge, because there's a smell in the air. <sighs> Guano. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Guano is excrement of seabirds, in this case, penguins. And there are lots of them. I can't say, you can't see them here, but there are thousands of them. Have no fear, we will see penguins up close. But that's your first impressive look at, at an area below the Antarctic um, convergence, well within the realm of Antarctica. And we sailed on because of the conditions, but that's OK, because it was an impressive sight just to be there. And I can say the weather can be unsettled, and we carried on our way. But you can get a sense just from the clouds, from the moods and the, these images, that um, it's not an easy environment, necessarily. You can see all those white caps there. It's not one that you play around with. You can't just decide to do something on a whim here. Everything is planned very carefully when we're talking about any sort of excursion. Even just to get closer to the land, you don't go right up to a glacier and look at it. Hey, look how pretty that is. Because a giant piece the size of a skyscraper could fall off and sink your ship or sink you. So it's, it certainly impresses you with its grandeur, and I don't say that in a, in a light way. I say really you're, you, you feel the magnitude of this place you're visiting fairly quickly. So this is where we made land, landfall here, Elephant Island on the north side. This was our planned trajectory, but the thing to keep in mind with all that weather is nothing always goes according to plan. You have a plan and you adjust it. So our idea here was to go here. Instead, we went from here to uh, here, where we would make our first landing. Because once you see penguins, you know, you want to see penguins. Once you see, get a taster, <laughs> right? So we wait till the water conditions are relatively calm, and we choose a landing site that is um, accessible and where the weather conditions permit. There are set locations where landings can be made in Antarctica. Tour operators have to abide by the International uh, Antarctic As Association for Antarctic Tour Operators guidelines. You can't just go wherever you want. They're fixed sites. Only so many people can go at a certain, at any site on any given day. Everything has to be kind of pre-approved and worked out. And, but there's a little bit of play in terms of when you go because of weather. So we pick a site where when the water's calm, everyone lines up and we head out in zodiacs, about 10 to 12 passengers. You see everyone decked in what's called foul weather gear that's meant to keep you nice and toasty. And, um, and then we make a landing. Now this isn't that landing, but just to show you kind of what, what a landing site could be. And this was the site of our first landing on an island called Half Moon Island. And it was a nice pebbly beach, and you go walking on a set trail. Once again, you can't just walk wherever you want because there are things to consider the conservation of the actual site and the features that are there. And we do a little bit of a, little bit of a trek, nothing arduous, but we go through a little pass, and uh, guess what? We see penguins. First species we get to see was the one that, that I showed you sailing or uh, swimming by the ship, the chin strap penguin. 
7.5 million breeding pairs in Antarctica. And just keep in mind when I said how much of Antarctica was covered by ice. So that means there is a large concentration of birds in, in a relatively small part of the continent. And they are kind of, I wouldn't say they're everywhere, but when they're in a location, there isn't just one, there's usually a lot. And they congregate. And this species, different penguins have different preferences. You think penguins are all the same, right? Like they're all, they, they're where it's cool. But this specific penguin tends to go on higher, rockier, inaccessible sites and to, to nest. And it's quite a handsome looking devil, don't you think? Beautiful, that eye. And it was a little bit of a dull day, but with more light, that eye's a really beautiful amber yellow color. Chin strap for obvious reasons, has a nice chin strap there. And a colony is always evolving. There's always something going on interesting. At this point in middle of February, this is towards the end of the breeding season. The young have hatched and are being raised, are close to fledging. This is a young one. You can see with the generous gray down on it, it is, it is almost in adult plumage. So it was losing its natal down. And they're wandering about. This one looks kind of funny. <laughs> Still has the down on top of the head. And they are being, they're looking for food because they're hungry and they still have to grow. And you can see this chick on the right with the down is basically almost the same size as the adult, but it's getting fed. And the adult is regurgitating food that it has captured out at sea. So, and it's, it's always fun to see all the action going on here. Chin straps lay two eggs. They will have, usually both will hatch. They won't necessarily both make it to fledging, but here, I, I wasn't sure exactly what was going on, but I knew this one was a, f uh, a youngster because he had a bit of a, the gray down on him. This one is also clearly one, and that's an adult on the right. And he, he looks like a cowering dog, right? The eyes, you know, when you, when you give a dog, you, uh, you discipline a dog. And this one, I, I thought this is like, you no. Know, aren't you to too old to be trick-or-treating or something? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> and even adults scolding adults, apparently, and the same sort of look, that little cowering dog, like, no, don't, don't hurt me. <laughs> so there's, it's, it's always very entertaining. And um, it's not... Penguin colonies have other things in them, other birds in them especially, uh, birds like these kelp gulls. You can see a couple of them there. They look like a great black back gull that you might have here on Lake Huron. And other birds. I was talking about guano. I'm sure you have some cormorants around here. You might not think of cormorants as beautiful, but if you see them up close, if you see the cormorants we have here up close, you'll agree. They are, they are beautiful. The ones down here, there's no argument because when you see them, they're just stunning. The Antarctic shag, which is a cormorant, beautiful eyes. And this bird, which might win the prize for the most pretty, ugly bird in the world, the snowy sheathbill. It is related to shore birds like sandpipers, and it is not a seabird. It doesn't fly out at sea, but it lives always around the coast, it lives in the penguin colonies, and it basically steals food that's dropped when the adult fails to deliver the food squarely into the mouth of the young. So it's basically a scavenging bird. And the thing, the wildlife here, I mean, this was shot with a, l a lens. When you go to these sites, you're not allowed to approach the wildlife with, to, within a certain distance. However, these things are unafraid. So they'll come up to you, they'll peck your shoelaces, and they're very curious about what they can steal off of you. So you have to kind of secure anything that you think might look like food. You don't feed them, of course. But um, there's always a lot of interesting stuff going on. Here, the product's a little bit prettier, I have to admit. This one is actually clean on a nice bed of snow. So. Our first landing and taste of penguins sated, we carry on. And the one thing, the, the, the nice thing about going so far south as it is with going so far north in Canada in the height of the summer is that the days are very long. So you, you have to hope you're not a very light sleeper, you're not disturbed by light, otherwise you, know, you wear the mask over your eyes because this could be 11 p.m. or midnight. It can look like this. It is that bright. So the days are long. You have a lot of time to enjoy being on the deck and just looking at what goes on around you. And um, 
once again, waiting for favorable seas. Some of these landscapes are phenomenal, I think, if you're a photographer at all. Everyone becomes a photographer in Antarctica. Do you have a phone? Can you, can you buy a smartphone, even if you don't have one? Can you buy a smartphone then, and, and figure out how to use it? Yes, yes, you can be a photographer in Antarctica and be fairly decent too. <laughs> These were taken with a smartphone. I think, I think that's an okay pick, I hope. And uh, the landscapes are stunning mountains, ice, sky, water. What else do you need, right? And we don't always have to do landings to enjoy it. We can just do a simple zodiac ride, which involves going out on calm water and taking our cameras along. And if the water's calm at times with permission, you can stand and have a look around and just admire the shapes. This looks like a snapping turtle head, doesn't it, sort of? You can, your inventive mind will find shapes and faces everywhere as you look at these landscapes. And just to give you scale, <laughs> that's a small piece of ice right there. I want to just go and swim right in that little pool there in a wetsuit. This looks like one of those deep sea fish, right? With a little bulb that hangs over the mouth. Doesn't look like a fish, like a piranha maybe, with the teeth, see that? So you see things, it's very entertaining. If you're looking closely, you might find other things in your images after you took the photo. And if you're really scouring the icebergs as you're cruising along, um, whether it's on your Zodiac or on the ship deck, you can see other things like these chin strap penguins. And, um, the interesting thing, there's always other things to discover on Zodiac rides. Antarctica was a major whaling center for many countries. There's still some countries who pretend to be whaling countries going down there, but it had a, a burgeoning whaling industry. There are lots of relics of the whaling years. We're talking 19th and early 20th century, like sunken ships, which make interesting studies too. And if you're looking and if you're a nice quiet area, you can also see whales that are surviving despite the historic whaling. This is a humpback whale that we had while we were sailing along. And, and we're not talking about hundreds of whales in one spot. We're talking about a couple of whales here. And just to give you a little taste of what those whales look like. Moving, there's a bit of narration going on here. And so the whales aren't disturbed by us. We keep a good distance. This is zoomed in. These are three humpback whales, which are just, they just appear to be basically resting there at the surface. Oops. Now, the weather I was showing you was beautiful. Wouldn't it be nice to go out and enjoy winter? Has everyone had a good winter? Yeah, no? <laughs> well, I can tell you, when you get a full sun and a landing opportunity, the, the, it's glorious, if you can believe it. Um, because the, the sun is surprisingly strong there, but when it's melting, as it is now in the late season, February, snow is melting. Snow that has fallen is melting away, although there's still a lot of ice on the land. And you can get the best tan, also if you wanted. And it's a great chance to get out there and, and do a little bit of exploring. Also great for, for photography too. In this particular case, this island we landed on is called Cuverville Island, and it is known for as a, a large uh, or important location for this bird, the Gentoo penguin. We talked about the chinstrap penguin, this is the Gentoo penguin. Many fewer of them in the world, 300,000 breeding pairs estimated, but that's still a whack load of penguins. And they seem to prefer lower, gentler, rocky slopes for breeding as opposed to steeper slopes like the chinstraps. And Penguins are, you know, relatively uh, <coughs> um, indifferent to us if we keep out of their way. So this particular site is very scenic. You see all that red stuff around the ground there. That's actually mostly algae that's growing off of penguin guano. A beautiful scenic site. Look at that glacier in the background. 
And these are places that can be on a beautiful day like this day was, beautiful sunny, easily five to 10 degrees. Everything feels very relaxed. It's a great place to just go and contemplate as you're inhaling the smell of guano. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great, right? <laughs> but, um, and at this time, once again, late in the season, you have, you can see chicks with at different stages. You can see older chicks, which are showing adult traits, younger ones, which are still very nice. And they love the sun too. Look at that, laying on a rock, keeping yourself warm. <laughs> But it's not all peaceful because these, these places are sites of uh, constant vocalization. The, the adults, inexplicably, they're sitting there and then they just break into this vocalization which sounds like a braying donkey. It's, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a, a clip of that, but the young are there expecting food. Look at the funny tongue on this chick. Look at, the, see it's like bristled, bristly, which I'll we'll come back to later why that is. So young are being fed, and if they're not being fed, they are looking to be fed, and they will chase down that wayward adult and kill they get what they want, and I feel a lot, great sympathy for these adults. And some young, even at this late stage, are very young. They, they need, these young here are just running around, not really defended by anything actively. Um, some are very young, they need constant attention like this one here. But for the most part, uh, it's relaxed. Some adults don't look like they're taking young and look awfully relaxed to be parents. That is because either they don't have young or they failed as breeders or their young have already fledged and many of them don't look quite so attractive. You saw in the young that were in the nest or that, that, that were walking around, they have gray down evenly on them and eventually that sloughs off and they have the adult plumage. The adults also have to molt. After the breeding is done, they go out to sea for a few weeks to fatten up. They come back on land and spend a few weeks, maybe a month, not feeding. They sit on land and they molt. And they molt all of their feathers basically kind of together. But it's not, it's not individual feathers coming out where you don't notice the molt going on. In this case, you see how those white feathers are like super high? That's because all new white feathers below are pushing all the old ones out. So it's a very interesting kind of molt. It's called catastrophic molt. And, and because they, they can't be out at sea in this stage because they don't have sufficient protection over their body. And basically just imagine like if you had skin, new skin growing and all of your old skin just suddenly falls off. That's kind of what's going on here. But the, the old stuff doesn't come off till the new stuff is under it. So it's really interesting to study. And these places are always places of opportunity as well. This bird is a skewa. There's two species of skewas, which are related to gulls. These are piratic, thieving, and predatory birds that are actively patrolling these colonies because there are penguin chicks there. There's eggs, there's chicks. And I have to say, I have something of respect for them. They, they are big birds. I said a gull. This bird is the size of a goose, like a, practically a Canada goose. And they sit in these colonies just watching for something to go wrong. When the penguin chicks are young, the parents guard them because they could not fend these guys off. But the skewas arrive. They're always very proud to announce their arrival, always with a scream. And they seem to be exceptionally, they, they always brag about their marriages because <laughs> when they get together as a pair, they're always doing this fantastic display. And uh, like, look at us. Now look how big that penguin is. The penguin is about that tall, like two feet tall. So imagine how big that bird is, that skewa, a giant modified gull. And um, they will cause panic in these colonies when they come, even though they don't go and necessarily kill the you know, younger chicks, they will cause panic. Look at that. A skew has landed and all the young waddle away, kind of running. And there's an adult that kind of makes, looks like he's going to chase the skew. The skew goes onto a rock and he's kind of safe there because the penguin won't get him. But look at that size difference there. This one's being escorted by an adult penguin away. And um, 
and then the, the, the penguin gives up. But huge bird. Now, you can think sometimes, well, OK, everyone has to eat. But in this case, in this short Antarctic summer, it is critically important because the skewas have babies too. This is the skewa chick. See that? It's kind of cute too, right? <laughs> you don't see its face, you can only imagine. So it is really a place of opportunity. Everyone is really trying to make the best of their time. So moving southward, out, I didn't tell you at the beginning, but you see this dotted line here, which is the Antarctic Circle. And our, we call this voyage a quest for the Antarctic Circle because we were going to try and get below the Antarctic Circle and do a landing here. Now, things don't, go according, don't always go according to plan. And we encountered rough, rough seas on that one day trying to get across the circle. This iceberg is the size of a, I would say a skyscraper probably, gigantic. I cannot, we're looking from the vessel. So just look, we're looking above the vessel here, basically huge. And we encountered rough seas, you can see that. So you don't play around with it, you respect it. That's kind of, that gives you a sense of that. And you know, two thirds of that iceberg is underwater. So just imagine that, however, one consolation, now I am a birder. <laughs> I love birds, I love all nature. I particularly love birds that I haven't seen before and getting good sight. One of them is this beast, which I think anyone would appreciate. I call it an angel, but this is the snow petrel, all white bird with just a black, black bill, black feet. Beautiful, striking, amazing bird that lives only in the very southern latitudes. And uh, you can find it further north, but you find concentrations of them further south. We could not land below the circle, but this was our own little consolation prize for, for us bird nerds. Anyways, but that's okay, because other places are dependable. And one of the places we would go to, which everyone goes to when they go to Antarctica, because you kind of have to. So we kind of went down there, we didn't get to land, but we came through here between the Antarctic continent and an island. There's this one channel called the Le Mer Channel. Now, probably you've seen this channel, even if you haven't been to Antarctica before. If you read magazines like National Geographic, because it's probably the most over-photographed place <laughs> in Antarctica. I wouldn't say over-photographed, but you know, very photographed. Striking channel, narrow with huge, tall, not quite cliffs, but slopes on either side. Wonderful glaciers cascading down into the channel. And the channel is effective, um, affectionately known as the, the Kodak Gap, or because it's so narrow, the Kodak Crack. And of course, who uses Kodak nowadays? It earned those days names, that name in the days of film. But really a place where we, we actually went through in the early morning and you know, you don't have to have breakfast because when you're going through here, forget about it. This crossing lasts like half an hour as you go through this channel between the island, which is on the left, the mainland Antarctica, which is on the right. And everyone just gets out there to enjoy because this is where you feel the immensity of, where you can feel the immensity of the mountains closest to you without climbing one of them or being on the continent itself. And um, just amazing. <coughs> and literally everyone is out there. <laughs> Can you describe the shoes? Do you wear special shoes? Shoes? Well, on the vessel, you can wear normal, good shoes like you would wear here on a day like today. But uh, you also get boots if you want. They, they, they have rubber boots on board. They have sort of a grip, a special grip uh, surface on the, the decks, which is like sand. You know when you put sand in paint or that kind of grit? And. Um, you know, this is de a dependable site. If it's sunny or cloudy, it's going to be beautiful in that channel, no matter what. But there are certain things that happen that you can't really depend on, necessarily. We'll look at that. How many p photos do I have in here of this place? <laughs> Incredible, really. 
there's a ski wall flying in front of the glacier. Look how big that glacier is, huge. That's a ski wall, so, uh, so, um, South Polar ski wall, one of those predatory birds. And there are th things that just happen that you can't depend on, as I said, like a raft of penguins on the base of an iceberg. <laughs> and it's really fun. You know, we can conjecture why they were all up there, but eventually they have to go. And if you don't go in voluntarily, you're going to go in somehow, or you will be pushed in. And I'll show you a video of that. And these videos were taken by my colleague, Jean Iron, who was very assiduous about taking videos. My, my iPhone, unfortunately, died at this time. Navigation down there, you're so close to the poles, the, the GPS word, your compass is probably getting a little messed up, right? So really that yeah. Um, in, yeah interesting question. So you're, you're well, the, the ship, the vessel is equipped. Uh, the, the joke is that that vessel is, you know, originally a Russian spy ship, <laughs> basically, from the Cold War era. And, um, and when you go onto, the, onto the, um, the bridge, which you're allowed to do at certain times of the day, even when the crew is there, you can actually see all the screens that they have. So they have all these charts, everything's live. You see where your vessel's going, you know how depth, you know the bathymetry, so the underwater profile. And so you know what you have to avoid, basically. And um, yeah. Yeah. Good question. Is it a lot of landmark? Um, yeah, I would say it probably is. The crew is very experienced. I mean, they're doing a number of back-to-back, -back, oh, maybe 10 departures on that same vessel back-to-back -back over the winter, over our winter. So, oh, well, the penguins are here, apparently, just where I left them. And, hey, everything's here, so, okay. Let's try this again. So yeah, so everything, I, I can't explain, I, I don't know to, the, to what degree they're using landmarks versus other things, you know, experience versus, um, let us get back to there. That was quick. So there they go, let's see if this works. Okay, no, I don't want Dropbox. Yes. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let me, uh, let me go back, penguins. No. Okay, there you go. I can't imagine how that doesn't hurt, but apparently they're very well insulated. Oh, okay. That's fun. Now, that's a good. Whoa. Good 14 feet drop, I think, at least, judging by that little, and then they're all gonna go, and who can't like that, right? So, uh, it's a fantastic little experience, and you know, you don't, even if you missed landing at one place, there's gonna be something interesting happen, and if, if you didn't just kind of go with the flow at times, that, we would have missed those penguins had we done what we originally had planned to do, so, oh. Um, you know what, the, this, how noisy are the penguins when they're doing that? We couldn't hear them because they're relatively far and just the scale of the environment is, um, is this going to go? Oh, here we go. Okay, my mouse is, there we go. So, question for you, based on what I've shown you so far, how many of you would like to live in Antarctica? <laughs> Because it might surprise you, but there are, in fact, people who live in Antarctica, depending on the time of year, between 1,000 to four to 5,000 people live there. There are a number of research stations and bases that are in Antarctica. This is one of them, which happens to be of Argentinian origin. You can tell because the Argentinians have painted their flag on the roof here, so you can recognize it at a distance. There, but there are there are some people there in these remote outposts, and there are various territorial claims to the continent based on countries that were 
involved initially in exploring Antarctica or that are very close to Antarctica, like New Zealand is over here, Australia here. France established a base here a long time ago in the early 19th century. And of course, overlapping claims like Argentin, uh, Argentina and United Kingdom, who both claim the Falkland Islands too, no surprise, which are over here. And um, although no one really owns Antarctica, a number of countries established these bases initially, or as early as they could, to, to maintain some claim to sovereignty over parts of these. And so the Argentinians did, the French did, the British also did. And we have a chance to visit a couple of these bases, which I think you might find surprising. This is one that's called Port Lockroy. Port Lockroy, it's a British uh, base, kind of. It used to be, it, was, it looks very bleak, doesn't it? Sort of dark and depressing, and that was just the weather on this one day. This base was, in fact, um, built in 1944 as part of the British attempt to claim part of Antarctica, and it was used as a research base um, till 1962 and then abandoned. And then in 1996, it was converted to a museum. It was opened as a museum to commemorate the British presence in Antarctica. So you, you make a landing here, and um, you go down a little path, which is quite narrow, but safe, and you go into the building, which is maintained, it looks like it did in 1960, if you can imagine. I'm not showing you photos of the inside, but you might think that, well, I'm living in a penguin colony, so this has got to be fun, right? And um, if this one plays, Okay, watch in the background. There's an adult Gen 2 penguin that's gonna come down the path. See it coming down the path? <laughs> this is a youngster here in the foreground, kind of blocking my way. There comes the adult. <laughs> okay, watch, watch, watch. Now this is gonna get shaky, but watch what goes on. Oh wait, I want food. <laughs> my camera flips, but it's like, uh, oh, no, I don't give up yet sideways, but I, I'm not giving up. I don't even know where the adult, the adult escaped. Anyway, she escaped the fury of the youngster. But, um, but uh, the place looks bleak. You can imagine, um, in fact, at this site, there are four people who live here during the tourist season. This is one of the, the most visited places because you can send postcards from here. <laughs> so you stop at the shop, you can buy something which supports the UK, the United Kingdom, Antarctic Heritage Trust, and, um, and why, not, why not be in a penguin colony? Four people, either four males or four females live there, they have to apply and be carefully screened to work here, and they have to pass all these examinations to make sure that they can get along really well with other people. <laughs> because you're gonna be on this little rock with three other people for four to five months, you better get along, you and the penguins. If you can't make friends with people, you're gonna have the penguins. <laughs> it's gonna feel really lonely. So it's a really interesting place to visit. Oh, there's a, a, a sheath bill stealing food from uh, penguins there at that site. But the penguins get friendly, even though you don't approach them, they approach you and you can kind of be friendly with them that way. Now I asked you if you want to live there. You don't necessarily have, you can't actually live in Antarctica, but there is one place where you can do something special, which is you can actually spend the night on, on the Antarctic, on Antarctica, basically. And this is a beautiful place called Dorian Bay. There's actually a couple of uh, a British and an Argent, a Chilean, I think, outpost here. Spectacular site. And in the evening, if you want, you, will go, you can go to the land, dig out a trench in the snow, doesn't this sound inviting already? And insert yourself into multiple sleeping bag inserts, finally into a sleeping bag which goes into a cover, put that whole thing and yourself into a trench and sleep with very little night, night darkness. Try that once and tell me, tell me you don't love it. Try this in your backyard before you, first, before you go down to Antarctica. I can say I did it to, to do it. I don't think I'd do it again. 
it was quite damp at a certain point. You were warm until a certain point. However, the night sky, although it's not very dark, is beautiful. The ship moves out of the bay at night, so you don't see anything, and it's, it's quite a, an experience. But you appreciate the rigors of the environment. Now, one thing I haven't talked about, which I'll talk about briefly, did anyone associate Antarctica with seals? I don't think anyone mentioned them at the outset. Yeah. But there are seals in Antarctica, and you'll get to see a number of them. This is a Weddell seal, which looks like a cat face. You have Antarctic fur seals, which spurred on the massive move to exploit and to develop Antarctic resources. This one has a valuable fur, as I said, $5 a piece in 1800. You get the southern elephant seal. Huge seal, largest seal in the world. Males can grow to about 16 feet long. And they are not used, they were not exploited for their fur, but they were exploited for their fat layer of fat blubber up to six inches thick. And elephant, because these are younger males which are molting on land. But you can kind of get a hint of it here as they age, you get this giant proboscis. You've seen those males on TV with those giant inflatable sacks on their noses. That's what these guys are. Huge. And when they lumber on the beach, you give them way. You don't want to be underneath one of those things at all. And um, older males and younger males all together. And you might be surprised really how many seals you'll see out there in random places. Watching from a pinnacle, the pinnacle where the uh, in original photo was from the, the first slide where I was on a rock, looking down, there was a school of like 30 seals. These are a seal, and was surprised by that in an isolated place, it was this seal, the crab eater seal, which despite its name, doesn't eat crabs at all. He was sleeping, we kind of approached at a distance, and you see it looks like he's been drooling on himself while he's sleeping, possibly he has, and then he goes back to sleep. It's a bit of a hint of what he's eating. That's not blood on his face, that's actually food. And what is he eating? Not crabs, krill. Krill, which is kind of like a shrimp, it grows to about two and a half inches long. Trillions, perhaps, of these things inhabit the waters around Antarctica. And in just astounding numbers, especially at, in the warm season, the krill are, are found in all these areas with the pink dots. They are the base of the Antarctic food chain, and everything, almost everything, that is a mammal or a bird, will eat krill. Millions of tons of krill are consumed by seals. If the krill are not out in the sea, they're underneath the ice, living like these ones are. They're big enough that you can actually see them. And that crab eater seal is in fact, the, the abundance of krill is so great, the crab eater seal is the most abundant seal in the world. There's 15 million crab eater seals. And as I said, they don't eat crabs, they're eating krill. In fact, their teeth are designed, this is a side view of the skull, as sieves. And when it, it gulps up a huge mass of krill, it squirts the water out like a flamingo or like a baleen whale and eats krill. And krill is kind of pink and it, when you drool, it leaves a stain on your face. That's what the penguins are eating. That's what everyone's eating. Check this out. Seals consume 63 to 130 million tons of krill a year. Whales, 34 to 43. Birds, 15 to 20. That includes penguins, which are birds. Squid, fish, total 150 to 300 million tons of krill consumed by other animals every year. That's everything. So really, they're the base of the ecosystem there. We don't see them. We don't see the krill, but they're there. We didn't see them, but you can. Even this beast, does anyone recognize what this is? Maybe from TV or National Geographic? Leopard seal, perhaps the most loathed creature in Antarctica. It is famously known for eating penguins. This is not my photo, this is from National Geographic because it, it does eat penguins. However, even it, will eat perhaps 45 to 50% of its diet is krill. 
However, I don't think it ate krill on this day. I think it might have eaten penguin. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But it has a most unhandsome face. I don't know. What do you think? Cute. Cute? Yeah. You can watch them from distance. You don't want to get too close. Surely it won't bother us humans, but it's, it just seems to be something you want to keep away from, and we, we take care to keep a good distance from it. But all of this is sustained by krill. Now, closing moments here, folks. As I said, things happen spontaneously. We take advantage of opportunities that happen. One day we were going to do a zodiac ride, and a zodiac ride was interrupted. As we went through a bay with these beautiful icebergs, we were expecting, oh, we'll get a nice zodiac ride, and that'll be fine. And then something showed up at a great distance. There's always someone watching. There were three fins that were tall fins that were sticking out of the water. Not over here, but within our view. And they happened to be, what do you think that is? Three lights. These are orcas or killer whales. There were three. Now you think of killer whales being in large groups. For some, I do. I've always thought of them as that way. But there were only three. And killer whales, the name killer, they kill things. It may not be apparent to you, or maybe it's not something you've heard of, but there are different types of killer whales in the world. Some of them eat only fish, some of them eat only seals, some of them eat only whales, and although they're all one species, it is thought that through culture, way back, one whale ate, a, a killer whale ate a, a seal, and it decided to like seal flesh, so then it and its uh, associates started feeding on seals only, and they were different enough from the ones that like penguin that they'd stopped interacting with each other. Okay? On this day, we happened to find whale-eating killer whales, three of them. Now, this may sound dramatic. Um, I'm, I'm, this is the male with a huge fin, which is six feet tall. The fin is six feet tall. Think about that. And they were going about and they looked like they were doing something and we weren't exactly sure what they were doing. And they were swimming around, it was, it was just, obviously they were very active. And guess what? They had killed a whale. These are, this is a minke whale specialist. A minke whale is the smallest baleen whale. It's about 40 feet long. They had killed a whale. Now why weren't we seeing the whale? Because they had eaten it, or there's something that happens to whales when they die. Except for the whales that are called the right whales. You've heard of right whales? Right whales are called right whales because they float. Other whales sink. And these three whales were shredding a carcass that was floating. I know, I see the nods already, the looks of disgust. Somewhere down there, under, close to us, was a suspended minke whale carcass and these killer whales were coming up for air but they were going down eating coming back up for air and it was not obvious what they were doing but that's what they were doing in the meantime hundreds of different seabirds were coming around these, these storm petrels which are tiny little birds size of a swallow they're a petrel a seabird they were going around dancing on the water picking off what was not apparent to us. And then, <laughs> and I don't have a photo of it, unfortunately, the, uh, one of the whales came up with this square piece of blubber, like that big, probably, came up to the surface like, oh, there's the minke whale, <laughs> like that. And then we started seeing other little pieces of whale floating under, underwater, and these skewas would come and fly, and they don't normally dive, but they were reaching as far as they could to get a piece of whale. And what were all those little storm petrels doing? Picking up bits of something? All of that blubber, which is oil, was getting kind of pulverized into droplets and floating on the surface, and everyone was feeding on this whale. Which, what did it feed on? It fed on krill. So, um, folks were up on the deck for an hour watching this, 
taking thousands of photos. I ran out of memory disk space. I, I, don't, have, I don't have any more memory cards. I'm done. I have. <laughs> and it was amazing. And this whale seemed to kind of be rejoicing once they stopped feeding. They flapped, they were smashing their flippers in front of us and really making a show of it after it was all done. And I felt that it was sort of a very fitting Antwerp trip. It brought us brought to the fore the realities of life. Not everything is pretty. It's a hard environment and everything is in some strange way connected. And that was the end of our day in a beautiful location. So just finish with some images from the trip. That's algae. <laughs> Is that Spider Man? Do you see? Thank you. Are, are, I have time for questions. Yes. Um, you were saying that uh, where you landed in the Antarctic, yes, it was common. But there's a lot of Antarctic coast to go. Is there any other landing spots from a different location? that people would go to do what you just yeah. did? Great question. So the question is, are there, besides where we were on the Antarctic Peninsula, are there other places where you can land? As, uh, as tourists, I would say no. I don't, even, I don't think there are other places you can go as a visitor. There are, because 95% of that coastline has like a few dozen to many dozen meters of ice on it. There is no land. You're basically facing ice. So you can't land. There are a number of research stations that are uh, you know, on or near the South Pole, quite a bit further in, like actually on the, the chunk of Antarctica. Some are right on the ice. So those are remote places you get to by, I'm assuming by plane, with the glacier, with the ice as a land strip. But, but as visitors, there are no other places you go because they're just not available. First of all, second of all, um, that Antarctic Peninsula being the northernmost part is the only part that really thaws and has a spring. So it's the only place where there's wildlife that you see on land, like penguins. I mean, after the season's done, they go back to the ocean, everything freezes up and that's it. So most of the rest of the continent looks like, like there's nothing there from a, a, a wildlife perspective. There is something there, but unless you really, really like ice, uh, I don't know if you'd go to the other places. Yes. In that last shot you showed you where the mental whale was killed, would that have been a combined effort of the other whales okay. killing it, or would it just be one at a time? Okay. So the question is, with the three killer whales, did they cooperatively hunt to kill the minke whale, or did they did one of them kill him? We we don't know. I I would assume that I would guess that the male killer whale with the tall fin, I would guess that he initiated the hunt and that could be you know dragging uh, pulling a flipper pulling the flukes and then everyone the other two come in and start working at it and uh, they can either drown it or it yeah it's i would think it's cooperative i would guess we don't really know because we weren't there but i would guess it's cooperative yes 
Yes, question. I thought the site at minus 46 on the Dogsman expedition. Yeah. I have no cover. I want to know, did you experience this exact same peace that I spent, felt? Or did you sleep outside? Oh. The question is that you, the comment is you have slept outside with a, on a dog sledding expedition, minus 46. Yes. So when we did the outdoor sleep, um, it was about zero degrees. It wasn't that cold. The air wasn't that cold. It went below zero. It was very peaceful. <laughs> the only thing is that it was the melt season. So there's a little bit of melt water going under the snow under us. And that kind of has a dampening, literally a dampening of feel on your body. You kind of, so more comfortable at minus 46. It's probably more comfortable at minus 46 when it's really dry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Any other questions? Yes. Change global warming changes? Climate change, global warming changes. Great, great question. Um, interestingly, places like the Antarctic, well, Antarctic Peninsula is the furthest north. The glaciers there are, I think they're shrinking. However, on the main part of Antarctica, the, what's the, called the eastern part of Antarctica, the glaciers are actually growing. So it's, it seems kind of counterintuitive. I'm not sure that they've seen, uh, I think when we're talking about the, the changes in terms of temperature, I don't think they're that great. It might be you know, less than a degree at the most. So like when you go in December, it has snowed, like it's snowing there, uh, it looks, it looks like it should look at that time. I think the changes we see might be minor, but in terms of the glaciers, they measure how much they're calving, like how much volume are they shedding. And uh, so yeah, in the, in the peninsula, they're probably shedding more, but in the east, they're growing. Interestingly, Antarctica is the driest continent. Someone mentioned dry when we started this talk. And uh, it is, I do not understand the, the continent gets on average four inches of snow a year, like the main part of the continent. That's nothing, like we have four inches of snow here. And yet these glaciers grow on that much snow a year. I don't understand it. And they're, you know, they're kilometers thick. And they, they calve, they shed icebergs, and yet they still are advancing and they're still growing in some cases. I, does anyone have an answer to that enigma? Well, they get some more snow, but how does how does a glacier calve? Yeah. Because the uh, temperature's rising. Yes. Is it, is it pulling moisture out of the air? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I, I would suppose that's a good, good, interesting point. Well, moisture out of the air. Um, I guess if the the glacier may move faster, too, but I'm not sure. I would think the ground is frozen quite well underneath. There's a uh, glacier in Argentina. Yes. It's yes. Confident. Yeah. Yes. Civic? Yes. Yeah. More snow. Yeah. Interesting. Another question? Um, you said that trip was about what? Two and a half weeks? That trip was in, no um, eleven days, twelve days, Did including you including. In, uh, in this case, we were in Punta Arenas. Yeah. There's different bases. Uh, Punta Arenas is one place in Ushuaia, which is in Argentina. Yeah. Those are two places where trips start mm -hmm. to Antarctic Peninsula. Yep. How much did it cost? How much did it cost? Talk to me later. Not necessarily you, but not <laughs> somebody who wanted to make that trip anticipate to pay. Uh, not necessarily including yeah. I would say, how much will that trip cost? I would say budget starting 10000 yeah, it's not inexpensive. It's not inexpensive. Yeah, it's a trip of a lifetime, though. I'll have to say. Um, I mean, I may go back to Antarctica. I don't know if I'll ever go back. But and I, I'm in the travel business, so I, I say it from one particular way. But I'm most interested to know the people who've been, who are, you know, they're they're paying to go there. And uh, certainly, the impressions I got were that it's a trip of a lifetime, and it's you know, it's it's certainly worth the expense. But I'm going to talk about the dollars and cents now. But anyways, comment, yes. Or this is what you can ask. I've seen your bio has more work with fishers. I'm sorry? Fishers? Fisher, the animal? Yeah. Yeah, note about fishers, yes. Now I'm just going to so recently cited something in King Carter. Is that like reintroduced to this area, or is that uh, they find it right here? We're, we're referring to Fisher, the weasel family, animal, the weasel family. 
Um, I would think they're not reintroduced. I'm sure they're spreading. Uh, there was one scene at Long Point wow. last week on the tip of Long Point, which w presumably walked across Lake Erie last year, I'm guessing, when it was, or w whatever year it was very cold, uh, from Pennsylvania. So they, they can spread. I don't think they've been reintroduced for years. So uh, any other questions about Antarctica or anything else? Well, I'll be here for a few more minutes, I guess. So I'll be happy to speak with you afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Did you want to say something? Is that it? Great.
preceding program was brought to you by Bruce Telecom and White Men TV.